Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Andrew Prokop. Uh, Andrew is the Director of Emerging Technologies here at ASI and has really been involved in the world of communication since the early 1980s. Um, Andrew has a, a number of, actually five to be exact, U.S. patents uh, around the development in uh, SIP technologies. Uh, more recently, uh, Andrew's used his uh, knowledge and expertise um, and has been developing software that integrates into the Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, um, ITSM via ServiceNow, and uh, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about today um, via Breeze. So you know, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Andrew. Um, Andrew, go ahead and take it away. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I don't know where you are, but here in Minnesota, it's a beautiful sunny day. It's supposed to almost hit 40, and for us, that is a heat wave, a tropical heat wave. So uh, I hope to get out and enjoy it uh, later on this afternoon. But until then, I really want to talk about IoT. So as Mark explained, um, I have a long background. I, that's a polite way of saying that I'm old in uh, communications technologies. Um, my background originally started as a software developer, so um, I worked uh, developing um, a lot of different products for a lot of different uh, verticals and horizontal industries. Uh, have a big background in contact center, uh, software development, and also in SIP. But none of this has to do with uh, SIP today, but actually some of it has to do with some contact center stuff, and we'll talk about that as, as the presentation goes on. So uh, let's just jump right into it. Let's jump right into IoT. And I start with a, just a couple of slides that I think are interesting. I just sort of poked around the Internet and looked at um, really where the industry is going. And clearly what's, where it's going is it's, it's, it's just going bonkers in terms of uh, IoT. Um, as consumers, um, uh, incredibly so. Um, more and more of our devices are becoming IoT devices. We're controlling our houses. We're controlling our lights. We're controlling our garage doors. Um, I have a coworker who has an IoT device on her dog. Uh, Elaine, you know what I'm talking about. Her dog runs around her farm, and she knows exactly where her dog is and where her dog has been. So uh, as consumers, we've adopted this technology wholeheartedly, and, and the same thing is happening in industry as well. So more and more industries are adopting the technology. Uh, sensors are just appearing everywhere uh, in, the business, in the business cycle. Um, and then the, the dollars spent, uh, obviously, are, are going astronomical as, as well. And so we see in the consumer world, um, Gartner's predicting something like a, a tripling of the money from uh, 2016 to 2020. Um, and we're seeing uh, similar trends in the, in the industry as well. So this is not a technology that's going away. It's a technology that will become pervasive and things that will be part of every one of our lives. Um, if it isn't already, and it's certainly a part of my life, and I'm, I would be surprised if, if it hasn't touched um, everybody here on the call today. So IoT crystal ball. So let's sort of look at uh, where things are going and what's happening. So um, sort of mimicking what I just said before with those slides, by 2020, more than half of major new business processes and systems will incorporate some elements of the Internet of Things. And this comes from Gartner. So by 2020, really, I mean, everybody that you're dealing with um, is looking at this, and t half of the major business processes and systems will use it. Um, um, similar sort of thing, discrete manufacturing, transportation, and logistics, and utilities will lead the industries in IoT spending. Uh, improving customer experience. I love this. Improving the customer experience, 70%. And then safety, 56% are the two areas that, that enterprises are using the data generated from IoT solutions. And so I certainly love the, uh, the customer experience because I want better customer experiences for myself. Um, and this, again, 70%, uh, that, that is a huge number of how enterprises are using the data generated by all these IoT uh, devices and solutions. And, and all these things, these three slides are all happy, joyful slides. But then we get to this one from Gartner. Um, through 2018, 75% of IoT projects will take up to twice as long as planned, twice as long. So clearly people want this technology, clearly people are investing this, in this technology, but unfortunately it's proving to be much more difficult than they realize. 
And and why is that? Well, really, because IoT is is actually not that easy in, in in some at the at the at the scalable mass solutions level. Um, Gartner again, uh, skills and resources to build, deploy, and run IoT solutions are often scarce. Training is limited, so you have this grand plan for rolling out uh, this huge IoT solution, but you don't have people that know how to do it. Um, it's so. Again, it, it's we don't want to put the, the horse before the cart, but we need to think these things through uh, intelligently. And this is where all of this presentation comes in, is, is how do we make it easier? But before we even get to the, working on the solutions, we need to look at the, the protocols and the devices. And, and this, is the, this is the geeky stuff that I love. I, I'm a, a protocol person. I love bits and bytes. Um, I love to look at, you know, Wireshark traces of messages and, and they're, to me, they're like mystery novels or puzzles to solve. Um, there's not a lot of standardization in the IoT world. There are lots of different protocols that are used to move data from one place to the other. There are different physical layers. There are different session layer protocols. It's really extremely complicated when you get down to, well, I have this particular sensor and it produces this kind of data and I want to take this data and I want to get it into my, let's say, healthcare solution. And now I have this sensor that does something very different and I want to get that into my healthcare solution. And I have now another sensor or another device. So the complexities are, are, are such that it's really difficult to manage. If you were to go and say, I'm going to start from scratch and I want to build my own solution and I want to make it open enough so that I can have anybody's devices connect up into my system, well, again, look at all the different things that you need to address. Are you going to do this on LoRa or ULE? I'm going to talk about some of those later in the presentations or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or Bluetooth Low Energy or Zigbee or it just becomes uh, very daunting, very challenging. So what's happening in the industry, though, are people are, 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 are saying, we need to tame this. We need to say, if I have all these sensors on the edge, and I have all, these, all this information that these sensors are producing, I want to normalize that information, meaning what I want to do is I want to have the information come into some process that allows me to now treat every sensor um, on the far end is ex almost is exactly the same. So if I get a temperature reading from sensor A, I don't have to worry about that sensor B's temperature reading in a different format or temperature for sensor C in a different format. So all of the data gets normalized so that I see everything in the same way. So we, what we do is we have the idea of sensors connecting to the gateways. Now the gateways can support all of the different protocols that these sensors might do. Are they ULE? Are they uh, you know, BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, are they LoRa? How do they connect up? Well, you as the user, as the solution provider, you don't care because those go into a gateway. We normalize all of the information, and now we send this up into a data platform, and now we can start to build applications on the data platform. And as a kind of a geeky guy, I like to break things down even further into sort of these boxes. So like on the edge, we have sensors and edge devices, and they're multi-protocol, so they all speak their own different language. Now we have gateways that collect this information. Now they need to be multi-operating system, multi-vendor. Um, different gateways are going to have different requirements because of the sensors. Uh, how many gateways or how many sensors will connect to a single gateway? What kinds of sensors? What's the distance between the gateways and the sensors? Well, you work all that out um, in your design in your design uh, portion. But again, we're we're we're, I'm, we're dealing now with the solution. So we're, we want to get to solution. So we work that out. And then we bring this all into a data platform. And the data platform can run on lots of different things. It could be a private cloud. It could be a public cloud. We can use Amazon Web Services. We can use uh, IBM. We can you know, do whatever we want to do in the data platform. But now, when we start to look at solutions, we want to then have all this data that's been with the different protocols and the, 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 you know, different kinds of data. We normalize it. We bring the data platform. And now we want to expose that to the outside world as the solution developers to create these incredible, you know, healthcare solutions or transportation solutions or logistics solutions and, and do what we did back, you know, what the slides said earlier on is to have that uh, improvement in customer service and safety and things like that. So now we take these web services and this is where the presentation really begins as we run these into a workflow engine. 
and the workflow engine that we're going to talk about today is Breeze, Avaya Breeze. So if you've seen Breeze, well, you're actually going to see Breeze in just a little bit, um, it makes all the complexities on the left side of this slide very easy because you can get access to lots of complicated information in a visual drag and drop manner. So you don't worry about the fact that, again, I have 12 different types of sensors that are giving me information in 12 different ways and now each one of these things is multiplied across the country, across the world, so now I have hundreds of thousands of sensors well, coming into the data platform, and now I bring those again into Breeze, and it becomes much simpler because I'm dealing with, again, a, a simple drag and drop of visual interface, and you'll see that in just a moment. So again, so that just a moment is right now. So if you haven't seen the Breeze Engagement Designer, again, a drag and drop tool developed by Avaya, so it has all sorts of really cool things in it. One of them is uh, telephony communication. So you have all sorts of things to manage telephone calls, you know, good old-fashioned Ma Bell type telephone calls. We have voice and we have DTMF and we have speech and things like that. So you have all these different tools to manage those telephony things. We also have some of the more modern ways to communicate, sending emails, sending text messages and things like that. So um, me, I uh, I certainly use the phone, but I send far more emails than I call people, and I send more text messages on my cell phone than I call somebody on my cell phone. Um, so let's take advantage of those things as well and build those into, again, into the workflows. Breeze provides those things. We go a little bit further. Now we want to integrate with databases uh, because I have a database with information that I want to bring into these workflows. I want to talk to other cloud services, and so I have these RESTful web services interfaces to talk to other cloud services. And now I want to do things like, well, I want to bring this into Contact Center. I told you I was going to talk a little bit about Contact Center. So I can do attribute routing. So when I get the right kind of information, I want to find the right kind of agent to deal with that information. And so we have all the work assignment things to bring that into things like Oceana and, and, you know, and whatnot, bring that into your Contact Center. Well, this is what we've done at ASI is we've added a whole new cabinet with all these really cool tools to bring IoT into these workflows, very similar to what Avaya did with bringing telephony and bringing emails and, and you know, uh, SMS text and database and all those things that they've done, and I barely scratched the surface of all those things. We now have IoT, and we have, what is this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seven different things that we can do with IoT. And don't worry, I'm going to go in and I'm going to explain these things, and hopefully in a way that makes uh, sense to non-programmers, uh, explain what all these different things mean and how they can be used to build uh, really cool, powerful, uh, scalable, exciting workflows. So, um, so again, we just take these things, we connect them up with the Avaya things that are already there, like databases and emails and things like that. And in a very, very visual way, we create these workflows that say when this happens, we do this, and then we go and we do this, and we do this, and then there's the ability to kind of loop, and there's the ability to have like if-then-else type logic. Very similar to if you were to sit down and draw a flow chart on a whiteboard, is you draw that flow chart and you say, okay, now this occurs in the beginning, and then I want to do this, and then if this, then that, um, and let's take all that, and you put that on the whiteboard, now you can go and sit down at the Breeze Engagement Designer and almost literally translate your whiteboard into an application and then you know fill in the appropriate data and deploy the application and run the application and voila you you have your solution this application can be this workflow or snap and as if I call them can be triggered on an incoming phone call it could be triggered on an incoming uh, text message it could be triggered by some outside process telling the workflow to run so something in your database could occur and it can tell the process to run. There are a lot of different ways to do this, but the whole point is you take this very, uh, you can take the whiteboard, come up with the idea, and you uh, translate it into a breeze snap in our application, and, and there you go. So IoT, um, I'm going to talk about all of the different components that we have developed, um, and I'm not going to get too geeky, so don't get too worried, but I'm going to give you enough so that you understand what these things do, and then I'm going to look at them uh, from a, a couple of different a couple of different directions. Meaning, how do we invoke the technology and go out and talk to sensors? 
Uh, and then perhaps even more importantly, how do we get the sensors to talk to us so that when something happens that we are informed that that thing has happened and now we can take action and that action can come in any number of different forms because, again, the Breeze platform is so flexible and so extendable. So I'm going to talk, take these one by one. And I don't believe this, actually, this might be the order I take them. So look at me. So I actually did uh, something in a linear fashion. So we're going to start with, I think, which is one of the more, uh, kind of the, the most interesting, interesting, one of the most useful tasks. And that is something called IoT Snapshot. And that what it does is what the name applies is we go out and take a snapshot of the current state of a sensor. So, and you can have, again, lots and lots and lots of sensors, and we can deal with these sensors in many different ways, but I'm going to keep this very simple for now. I'm going to sort of deal with one sensor. So I want to look at one particular sensor. I want to get all the information from the sensor. If you've ever looked at Breeze, you ever uh, you know played with it, what you do is when you drag one of these things, one of these little widgets onto your canvas, you have the ability to set properties. And the, there are only two properties that you set for this guy. And one of them is this thing called the auth token. I can actually go to the next slide. This thing called the auth token. And think of that as the user ID of the IoT developer. So we've built security into this solution uh, from the beginning to the end. And so one of these things is you can segment who can control which sensors and, and get information from the sensors and things. And this is all done in a very encrypted way. I'm not going to get into the, the nitty-gritty details of the security and the encryption, but uh, we have an encrypted token. Again, think of it almost as a combination of a user ID slash password of the IoT developer or the solution developer, if that makes more sense to you. So that is the person that's authorized to use this technology. Now, that person authorized to use this technology will have a, have a bunch of gateways and devices assigned to that account so that you can use, uh, you know, you can get access to the information. And you can segment that any which way you want. But in this case, we need to know which of the devices we want to talk to. So, again, let's keep this really simple. I have a, a sensor in a conference room. So, me as the solution developer, I have my account. And then I say, well, it's the sensor in the conference room, and I assign a value to that, and then I can just pass that value in, and, and it can all the um, authorization says, yes, you know, Andrew, this account has uh, the ability to talk to the sensor. Now, what comes back from the IoT snapshot, and this is going to look a little, oh, not quite yet, yet, not quite there, but it, we have an output schema, and two things come back from when we ask the sensor, tell me your values. One of them is this result of success or failure. Um, did the operation work? Did it not work? And there's more detail you can drill down into, but at a high level, it's success or failure. And then this thing called the values, which is a JSON encoded string that's, uh, if you're familiar with JSON, it's really key value, key value, key value. So you can say, you know, first name, Andrew, last name, Prokop, uh, city, St. Paul, state, Minnesota. So key value, key value, key value. Well, this is how the IoT work is done as well. So you have all this telemetry information and the sensors can have all sorts of things. One particular multifunctional sensor might have temperature, humidity, light, UV value. Maybe it has heart rate. It's a medical sensor. And then it has blood pressure. It has any number of different things. So what it is is you'll get all of that information back in this key value, you know, temperature, 38, um, you know, humidity, 62, uh, UV level, 0, 0.0, light, you know, how many lumens, uh, you know, 657, something like that. So you get all that back, and it looks like this. It's a little bit, if you've never seen this before, it might be a little bit scary. So this is all the information. Notice there are values in here, and some of them say no result because some of the sensors don't support a lot of the values that get delivered. But so if I uh, to sort of highlight some of the things. So again, in this mess, it's not really a mess if you're a JSON person, but you have all the, the values. Like in this case, the temperature was 78.42. The orientation, alpha, beta, gamma, that's, you know, you twist a device around, you turn it around, you know, what's its um, orientation? Here's the humidity of 37.23, the UV level, there's a timestamp, there's accelerometer, if you're familiar with accelerometer, basically movement in the XY and Z axis and on and on and I pulled them out again to make them even easier to look at. So key value, key value, humidity, 37.23, LED status, if there's an LED on this device, in this one, in this case, it's turned off, so the LED is not lit. Uh, the accelerometer X, uh, the temperature. So that information can now get fed into a workflow and so the workflow may be, 
you know, you're monitoring the temperature of something. Uh, you want to go out and check the temperature of that thing. Well, you can go out and say, hey, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Sensor, tell me what you know. And it comes back with all these different values. And now you can easily use those in your workflow. There's a very, very simple ways and breeze to, to, to monitor, you know, pull the information from the JSON and put it into a, ver a, a value or variable that's just called temperature. And you can say, is temperature greater than 80? Is temperature less than whatever? So that's snapshot. Now, one of my favorites because it's kind of the most fun one to work with is just go out and talk to a sensor and get all the data. Another really fun one is location. So you may ask, you know, the, the sensor may tell you, okay, here's, here's my reading, but you want to know where the sensor is because sensors can be mobile. They don't have to just be, you know, you know, put in a conference room and there they live forever. The sensor could be in your pocket. The sensor could be on your wrist. The sensor could be in a vehicle that's moving around. The sensor could be whatever, wherever. And so we have IoT location, which is basically ask the sensor where it is. We've already seen the uh, auth token and device ID. Nothing has changed there. But we have a new thing, which is the location management family, because we can say, am I asking for a gateway? Where's the location of the gateway? or where was the location of the device. So you can say, I have a gateway that has 100 sensors to it, but I want to know where that gateway is physically. Um, gateways might not move around as much, but they could. Uh, devices could potentially move around quite a bit. So I want to know where the location of the device is. So what comes back from this, the output, is it gives me the results, success or failure, but it also gives me longitude, latitude, the timestamp, which is the last known time of this device where it was, and then uh, some GPS information, degrees, minutes, seconds, or decimal degrees. So if we take that and we look at one of the outputs, and so this comes back from, I'm asking a sensor uh, where it is, and then I actually uh, built this when I was uh, in New Orleans at Engage, and hopefully some of you folks were at Engage, but I built this slide out there, and what happens is it came back and said the degrees, minutes, seconds. Okay, if you're a GPS person or a, you know, a, a cartographer, you'll know what this means. But this is really the location information for this guy. So if I take this and it came back to me and I send this information into something like Google Maps, and that's the same information I'm just sending over, and it says, hey, you are in the convention center in New Orleans, and it actually came up on the map. So that information that I asked with Breeze where is the sensor? I can feed it into another application. Remember I said that Breeze can do web services and talk to other cloud services? Well, I can send it into, again, into uh, Google and say, hey, this location, show me a map of where it is. And voila, we're right there. We pinpointed down there. Next one, info. You might want to know about the sensor itself. It, it's telling you information. It's telling you where it was. Well, Tell me more about who you are. You know, what sensor are you? Maybe I've forgotten or I need to build that into my workflows. You can, with the platform, you can name the sensors and you can give them really geeky names like, you know, 16542 or whatever. Or you can say that it's, you know, pillar 342 northwest corner, whatever. But we go out and ask the sensor, tell me about yourself. Again, the auth token, the device ID, we've seen that before. And it will come back and it will say success or failure, and then it will tell us things about the device. In this case, it's telling me this one I, I've asked for. It's a Silicon Lab sensor puck. The, uh, the name that I gave it was just SI Lab sensor puck. I probably could have put four, two, you know, you know Andrews, Silicon Lab sensor puck, whatever. Uh, this one happened to be turned off, so I had it not enabled. So it tells me if the, the sensor is really enabled or not enabled. And then we get this uh, a, a UID of the, the sensor, which is actually what the sensor is telling us it is thinking of itself, almost think of it as a serial number. Okay, so that is um, info. Uh, trending information, one of my favorites, um, and that is, remember Snapshot? Snapshot said, hey, this is what's happening right now. Well, what if I'm more interested in how did we get here? So the Snapshot would say, hey, it's 72.6 degrees. Well, I want to know, well, hmm, did we get here because we rose to 72.6 or did we fall to 72.6? So I want to look at a, a window of time, a window of time to look at what, to look at this value over again and look at the trend. So again, auth token device ID, seen that many times. Two time, 
And I have a slide just coming up that explains this a little bit better, but it's the end time of the trending window. By default, it's right now. So if I say, if I leave two time blank, it says from right now in this point in time, and we go back an offset, one, two, three, four, how many minutes, up to 20 minutes, we can look at a window of the values. And the telemetry family is, are we looking at temperature, light, humidity, et cetera, any of the different values that the sensors will support. So I'm looking at, over time, what happened with this guy. And so what happens is we come back with results, um, uh, in, an output from this task. Again, success or failure. Then we get things like, well, the name, that is, what is the name of the value that we're looking at? And it's basically mimicking, mimicking back what you asked for. Yes, for temperature, well, this is temperature. What's the current value? Now, that's exactly like the snapshot. What's the, the current value for this? What, let's pick temperature. What's the current temperature? But now over this window, what was the high? What was the low? What was the average? What was the median? And what was the trending? So again, the trending high or low. And I have a slide that explains that in just a moment. So again, so here's an example of one that I ran. So came back and says, I was looking at temperature. The current value is 65.55. The median was 65.12. The average, 64 the the high and the low of 67 and 61, and my trend is a slight rising. So over the time period that I looked, and I can't remember, I think this was five minutes, I have a slight rising of that temperature. So, um, you know, if you think of a graph, you can see the temperature gradually going up over that five minute time period. And of course, it'll have highs and lows. So the like the stock market, you know, it could you know, go up and down, up and down, but it's moving in a particular direction. And this is my favorite geeky slide um, where I try and explain this, and, and you'll get the playback and, and the PDF of all this, and you can, you can look at this at your leisure, but this is how I try and explain trending. So if you think about the word change, so if the change is less than or equal to 5%, then we have a steady, the trending is steady. So the temperature hasn't changed much because it's less than or equal 5%. If we have the temperature um, rise more than 5% or fall, but or more than 5% but less than 25%, we get a slight rising. Um, more than 25%, we get a rising. And the same thing with falling. So if we have, the, we have a steady, we have slight falling, and we have falling. So there, I won't explain all the math of how I've done all this stuff, but I look at the large amount of data that's coming across. And that's a, something I, I forgot to point out is not only are these sensors could be complicated in terms of how they talk, but how much data they produce. They can produce uh, tons of data, you know, uh, gigabytes, uh, terabytes of information if you look at these things long enough. And so what we're doing is we're taking all this data, aggregating and building, you know, my little mathematical formulas uh, to determine this information. Okay, so let's go to the next one, IoT device. Um, IoT device is the ability to talk to gateways. The, it, it, it has to do with how the gateways communicate with the device. At this point in time, it's really to turn gateways, the relationship between a gateway and a sensor on or off. So we've seen off token, we've seen device ID, seen those already. Gateway, that's a little bit different. So here's the, the gateway that we're talking to. So it has its own name, its own you know, hardware ID. So we're saying this device on this gateway, I want you to start monitoring it or I want you to stop monitoring it. And this could be useful if you have uh, backup situations where you have multiple sensors in the same area, but you don't want to collect the data for the multiple sensors until there's a reason. And maybe because it's fault tolerance, you want to have some sort of resiliency failover plan, or maybe it's because when I get into certain situations, I want to turn on more sensors because I want to zero in on what might be happening. So I have a sensor in a room and it's always reporting data. When I start to come to an anomaly con uh, condition, we, simply, we set some criteria, now I want to say, oh, I need to turn on three more sensors in that room because I need to be refine this a little bit more. Okay, so start or stop. Output, really this one's very simple, success or failure. Either I started the, the gateway talking to the device or I couldn't. Uh, IoT state, this is, oh, they're all cool, aren't they? But this is a, an interesting one, kind of a strange name, but what it allows you to do is set the state of a device. And the state, think of it as really a command. So auth, token, device ID, seeing this. Um, state is a command sent down to the device, and it's JSON encoded because I love JSON. Um, in this case, 
this this little geekiness, and that's all documented in the, the reference guides and all that, tells me to turn this LED on or this LED number one on or LED number one off, so true or false. But I can have also different different kinds of sensors that have other kinds of things, like maybe a camera, tell it to go into high def mode. So again, you may be collecting data for a particular room or particular part of a building, and then I have some condition occur, and I don't want to always be collecting diff information in high def, but now I need to drill myself down so I would go and say, hey, camera, go into high def mode. So this is sending a command to the, to the device. The, it's the results back are either success or failure. Uh, here's a very, very um, simple example. So I have a Thunderboard React. Uh, um, it's a board that I like to play with. It's a really cool developer board because it has the kitchen sink in terms of um, uh, capabilities, in terms of what I want to look at. Does orientation, does uh, accelerometer, it does uh, temperature, humidity, light, and UV value, and I can get my positioning information. So uh, that sensor, see those little LEDs? They're right in the middle, LED. Uh, I can't even read it. It's like one or two, but it's A or B or something like that. So there are two LEDs on this board uh, right in the middle. Um, I use the uh, state command to, this is, this is really low budget, to turn those lights on, to turn the LEDs on. So I can say turn the LEDs on, turn the LED off. Now you might think, well, that's kind of silly, but imagine that um, it was more of your writing to a display, or you want to alarm, set an alarm that you can say, you know, when this red light goes on, think of like gas leaks, and you have the lights that are sitting there, and, and um, you have the red, the big red, the big red light go on. So I want to say, red light go on, red light go off, those sorts of things. Or again, camera go into high def mode, go out of high def mode. So this really simple example is I just showed you how I was turning the blue, the blue and the green LEDs on, and then I can turn them off again. So I'm going to change. Um, directions just ever so slightly. I'm going to get back to Breeze, but I'm going to talk about actions because this is really important. This is a good place to make a little bit of a change here. Okay. In the platform, so we go back into the platform because the platform is the thing that really talks to the sensors. The platform is the thing that has the gateways, that does all the data collection, that um, allows you to mine the data because it puts all these web services on top of it. You don't have to worry about it because Andrew worried about it and he did all that work and built that, built that into these drag and drop tasks. But there are times when you need to get a little closer to the sensor. And one of those times is you want to create rules or asynchronous actions. And one of those could be, again, something like if the temperature rises or the light level falls or the UV level or the pressure or the accelerometer value or if this device tips on its side because I'm looking at orientation, uh, I want to know about that. So what you can do is you can create asynchronous actions uh, on those devices with different criteria. So I can say when this thing occurs, do something. Well, one of those things is it can actually send web services messages. Well, Breeze is a web service, well, is a web server. Uh, maybe you didn't know that, but it is. And it can accept commands from the outside world. So what happens is I can have one of my devices tell Breeze to do something um, to fire off a workflow. So again, this example, I'm saying send a post, which is a REST a web services command, to something, and I haven't filled in all the blanks, but uh, to this URL, which could be my Breeze server, and I can say when the humidity is greater than 70, I want you to send this command. Now the Breeze server gets it. The Breeze server, with some magic, uh, the way that we've built the call, says, well, which workflow should I invoke? Which data should I pass to that workflow? And so then it triggers a workflow. And how does this triggering occur? Because Breeze has these things called events that allow you to build events as to why a workflow gets fired. In this case, I build one, which is my IoT event, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying when this thing occurs, which happens to be like my humidity or my light or whatever, I want you to send a value. I want you to actually, I want you to invoke a workflow on a Breeze server. In this case, I built this one for temperature, and I want to send something about the temperature down. So I can say from the platform standpoint, send this 
request down to the Bree server, invoke this, this um, workflow, I can pass any data that I want to send. And that's the beauty of this is any data. I'm just sending one value. I send this down to my Bree server. There's my max temp in this point. And what happens is inside of Breeze, when the workflow starts, there's the max temp that was just generated in the other platform. So I've passed data from one platform to another platform. I now trigger my workflow, which is in what's called the start task. All workflows begin with a start task. Now I can do whatever I want to do with that workflow, which might be make phone calls, send text messages, send emails, go out and turn other sensors on. Remember I talked about let's go in and, and maybe send, get more discreet, turn more sensors on, put a camera in high def, whatever it is that we want to do. Send that, turn that red light on, turn that red light off. So again, once I've triggered from the platform, now I go into the workflow and now I get all the really cool fun stuff uh, that I can do with Breeze. So this actually brings me to that seventh task. I didn't do that one in the previous section because it makes more sense now. And that is IoT action. And IoT action goes back and it has an interface back into those actions that we just created back here in the platform. And specifically what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, which action do I want to enable or disable? So for instance, I have an action that says when the temperature goes above, 70. I want you to fire off this workflow. Well, what you don't want to have happen is while you are managing this problem, you don't want the workflow to get invoked again, and then maybe a minute later to get invoked again, and then a minute later to get invoked again. It's like, no, hey, dude, I'm dealing with this. So you have the ability to say, okay, I've captured this event. I'm processing it. I will go back and turn off the action. And then I would do whatever it is I'm going to do. And then when I'm happy that I've done whatever it is I want to do, I can go back and turn the action back on again. Okay, if I haven't fixed the problem, it's going to be invoked again. If I have the, fixed the problem, it won't be invoked. So again, while you're dealing with something, you have the ability to go back and turn actions on and off within workflow. So an action can trigger a workflow. The workflow can maybe one of the first things it can do is basically say, got it. Okay, stop talking to me. You know, don't keep nagging me. Have you fixed it? Have you fixed it? Have you fixed it? No, I'll deal with it. And then when I think I'm done, I'll go back and re-enable the, uh, the action so that you can do, you can tell me again. Did I fix it? Did I not fix it? So output again to success or failure. Whew, that is the end of kind of the breezy stuff from that level. So let's actually kind of take a little look at uh, this in a little more um, practical manner, solutions manner. And I love this example because I think this is a great movie. Um, and if you were in person, I'd ask you what this was, but you're not. So I'm going to tell you, of course, you know this is Forrest Gump, and that's Bubba. And so what are they talking about? They're talking about shrimp. And Bubba's telling Forrest all the different ways you can use shrimp. And it starts, I think, in, you know, they're in their, uh, their locker, or, you know, in their, 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 whatever you call those, the quant, quant, quant whatever you call those huts. Um, and they're talking about shrimp. And then the next thing you know what, I think they're on the, the gunnery range. And then they're in the, finally, and then they're down in the, uh, washing the, the lit floor of the latrine with toothbrushes. And, and Bubba, after saying, well, you can fry shrimp, and there's barbecue shrimp, and there's lemon shrimp, I think he gets to finally says, and shrimp sandwich. And that's about all you can do with shrimp. Well, if we were talking about IoT, and Bubba was talking about all the things you can do with IoT, he'd still be talking because you never run out of ideas. You go on and on and on and on and on. You never run out of solutions for this. So I just sort of threw a couple of the sensors, just a little quick little check, uh, some, of the, some of the more interesting sensors. And I actually picked two of the more interesting protocols, ULE, which is ultra low energy, and lots and lots of consumer devices are using ULE. It has a really uh, a good distance. It's better than Bluetooth. Uh, it goes about 70 meters indoors, so that's with lots of things in the way. Outdoors with a clear shot, you can go about 500 meters. So these things can actually transmit their information pretty far to the gateway. So ULE, some of the things that you would use for ULE. Now, these next sets of sensors, these get more interesting because now we're talking enterprise. So we're back here. Now, these are currently, you, certainly you can use these for uh, uh, enterprises like glass break and, and temperatures and things like that. Um, but now we can start to get into more enterprise or city or municipality sensors, like smart parking sensors. That's done with a protocol called LoRa. 
And this stands for long range. Really clever. I didn't know that at first, and I had to say, what does LoRa stand for? It's long range. Um, these sensors, uh, well, LoRa is a really low power, ULE as well, low power consum consumption uh, uh, protocol. So you can build devices, potentially, that can run for years, like 10 years on two uh, AAA batteries. Um, so, I mean, one of the problems with uh, sensors and, and these different protocols and things are the, the more distance you get, uh, it requires bigger batteries, bigger footprint, uh, they're more expensive. So they're coming up with really low-cost ways of getting information from sensors to gateways. And then once we get to the gateway, now the gateway can be wireless, can be, you know, whatever, LTE, and get that up into the... Um, into the cloud, the gateways can be big. The gateways can be powered by you know big power sources. The sensors you often want small and cheap and low power. And so LoRa is a really cool po protocol for that. So I just sort of snapshot of some of the stuff that's happening with LoRa. But once you do that, now you can start to build all these cool solutions. Now we get into really uh, solutions building. So IoT and healthcare, a pill bottle that has a sensor in it. If the pills are not dispensed, and you know they're not dispensed by really unscrewing the cap and you know shake whatever the sensor has ability to say that the, the cap has come off. So I'm going to assume that the pill has been dispensed. Think of an EpiPen as well. You know the EpiPen has come out of its container. I can then generate an event that says that EpiPen has been opened. If any of your if you have kids that have EpiPens, you want to know that your kids open an EpiPen. You want to know if your kid has used an EpiPen. So you want this information to transmit. Uh, through some system that's fairly long distance, but you don't want to put too much money into this thing. You don't want to, your kid don't want to carry a battery pack. So again, LoRa is really kind of cool for that because again, LoRa can actually go up to about 10 miles. Um, and they're getting better and better with that. So you have these gateways in schools and if a kid opens their EpiPen at school, you're informed of it. So anyway, you build these workflows when the conditions occur in healthcare that monitor, that you have different teams that get fired up to do whatever they're going to do. A hospitality, you check into a room and you have an identity and there are different devices in the room. And, they, and, and when Andrew checks into the, you know, whatever hotel, uh, everybody knows that Andrew likes his rooms colder than most people do. So it can automatically adjust the temperatures to Andrew's setting. So I'm not always, you know, in the middle of the night, so, oh, it's too hot and I'm trying to find the thermostat and adjust the thermostat. It's doing it uh, the way that I want uh, the different sensors or the lights and the whatever, you know, um, those sorts of things in hospitality. Uh, food service and food service is absolutely huge. And going way back to that uh, slide early on where I talked about safety as one of the primary concerns. So safety, if I have uh, uh, those soft serve yogurt machines and I want to know if there's bacteria forming, well, bacteria is really difficult to detect. You need to have petri dishes and lab environments, but it's easy to detect the conditions in which bacteria grow. Uh, really, it's temperature and humidity. So moisture level. So if we can start to track those sorts of things, then we can create workflows with you know breeze that raise an event when something has occurred, gone out of uh, the, the norm, we can then use that to uh, dispatch a technician, shut the machine down, put that red light on it that says out of order, uh, any number of different things. So there's just a ton of stuff. Uh, smart beer kegs, uh, <laughs> smart fryers, smart refrigerators, smart whatever. Um, and then running this back into um, into some workflows because you know in the consumer world you're basically you've got one person with one device. In the uh, enterprise world, you can have ten thousand devices. Um, and so, how do we manage that? Well, that's how we manage that with workflows and something like Breeze. And then smart cities, and I love this one here too: uh, street lamps that can detect gunshots and gas leaks. So you put these all through your city. So if it detects a gas leak, then it uh, fires off a workflow that uh, you know does what all the things that it's going to do. So, you know, notify people immediately that there's a problem. Uh, notify the first responders. Notify the utility company or a, or a gunshot. So it hears a gunshot, and there are other sensors that are doing the same thing, and it triangulates where's that gunshot, and then I dispatch uh, emergency crews, you know, police, uh, whatever, to the place that it needs to go. So that no human being had to call 911. In a sense, the machine made the 911 call. Or security robots that uh, and I see these in malls, and I believe we're going to see these more in cities that can, you know, 
like the Jetson cops, you know, that are just out there roaming around, and when there's a problem, they can uh, indicate that there's a problem, uh, potentially resolve what they can, but most likely just get the right people there, again, through some sort of workflow to get the right people, attribute routing uh, to, to take care of this problem, again, in cities or in malls. This slide is a bit of an eye chart. You can look at it at your leisure later, but smart buildings, why you want to invest in smart buildings, uh, lots of different advantages of both the monetary advantages and also just your social responsibility profile. You know, um, This company is doing the right thing by you know, lowering their energy footprint in their buildings. So how can we get going on this stuff? Well, uh, we've offered uh, a couple of different ways. One of them is if you want to develop this with Breeze, and there are a lot of good reasons why you'd want to develop this with Breeze, is you would get the, uh, you want to, but you're not quite ready to make the uh, investment, you'd get our IoT Quick Start. And the IoT Quick Start gives you access to a fully equipped Breeze lab in the cloud, gives you access to uh, all of the IoT software, uh, I actually throw in a few more gimmies, some other stuff uh, with in terms of artificial intelligence and natural language processing and service now and some other you know, fun things. And then a sensor and you can actually start playing with this technology to understand how to make it work. Another way is Zang. I've been talking about Breeze this whole time. Well, all of this work is now inside of Zang as well. So now you have a 100% cloud-based IoT platform to develop a uh, solution. So you can go out and Get a, go to zang.io, sign up for a free account, um, uh, get a, 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 sorry, um, an account with our back-end system for the, the platform, and then start building your own uh, workflows. A lot of resources. So I've, uh, if those, those of you that know me know that I, I, I write quite a bit, so I have some articles uh, for on Avaya. I have some articles on No Jitter. Uh, there's some videos out there as well. Uh, one of my favorites is one that I a video that I took of uh, what the Avaya team is doing with uh, some of the, the with with the IoT IoT work that I'm doing. If you route it in Gage, and this is also going to be an Enterprise Connect, but they built a Lego Smart City, which is really cool. And I just did a a, a low budget video of uh, Nathan Studi uh, doing uh, showing the demos. It's gotten a whole lot better actually since the video and. Uh, um, I've been working with them on some other enhancements as well. So uh, things like train derailments, power outages, uh, smart parking, so and things like that. And they've integrated with uh, team stuff and text messaging and uh, uh, oh, it's sort of a notification system. So there's some really interesting resources out there uh, for you. And which takes me right to the end, except for a few questions. And I see some questions here. Uh, but I want to show you, and, and Mark introduced this in the beginning, is that we have a series of webinars. So the last one that was kind of leads into this one, so you want to go and find the playback for what is IoT. And, and Mark, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we're putting all these on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and you search for Aero Systems Integration, find our YouTube channel, you will find the playbacks for all these. And you may be sending them out to the folks as well, but I know that they're going on to YouTube. And then all the cool ones that are coming up in the future. So. So let me get to just a couple of questions here, and then uh, feel free to ask more questions. But I have a couple of them here, and that is, and this one just came in too, is, which is a good one. I should have covered it. Is when would I choose Zang over Breeze? So in terms of the IoT, they actually do the very same things. So it's the same features that are in Breeze are in Zang. So why would I choose one over the other? And really, it's it's your environment. How are you integrating this? Are you integrating this? Uh, really tightly with your current uh, via communication system? If the answer is yes, then Breeze is the way to do. Because uh, if you want to integrate with the contact center and attribute routing and all of the phone numbers and things and trunks and all that on your existing phone system, Breeze is the way to go. But if you're building a standalone solution that doesn't need to talk to your phone system, doesn't need to really talk to your contact center, but you still want to manage, uh, do the telephony stuff and the notification stuff that is provided with Zang, I would do it with Zang. So if I am a farmer and I want to create a solution uh, for my farm with my sensors that are maybe moisture sensors all in the ground, I don't own an Avaya system. So, But I could do that by building a Zang solution and get the same kinds of things, both the, the bi-directional, the sensors, you know, going out and telling, asking the sensors questions or the sensors asynchronously firing you off. Uh, another one, this is about the platform. How much or how long 
is IoT data stored in the cloud. Well, that's really how you want to set it up. So if you want to store lots of data, so remember trends can look at patterns over time. And what I didn't explain perhaps then was I can pick windows anywhere in the time of the data. It doesn't have to be just now. It could be anywhere in the time of the data from the point you started gathering data till now. Well, how much are you gathering? Well, that really depends on how much, you know, how much do you want to pay for? How much data do you want to store? If it's your own private cloud, uh, you'll be certainly engineering that. If it's a public cloud, you'll be paying for that. So you want to figure that out. So it's really how much do you want to do it? Uh, here's another one. Uh, at Engage, I saw a demo that combined IoT with ServiceNow. Is that available as part of this offering? Well, the answer is uh, yes and no in that it is available. It's not the IoT offering, but it's its own offering. So if you have um, development that involves uh, talking with ServiceNow, and I, I have a really cool video. In fact, if we come back here to one of the... Uh, the resources, oops, this one, uh, the third one down, uh, the service management one, that actually shows you how you can combine ServiceNow and Breeze and IoT. So it's it's not part of this offer, it's its own offer, but yes, uh, we offer a ServiceNow integration um, that can be invo uh, combined with your Breeze um, workflows. It's not part of Zang at this point in time, it's part of Breeze, so if you want the ServiceNow integration, then you're using the brain. The, the sorry, you want the ServiceNow integration. You're using Breeze, and you're not using Zang. And that was it for questions. And my goodness, I think we are almost exactly right on time, which is good. So maybe I'll give you a couple minutes back. So if anyone has any more questions, um, ask them now. Otherwise, um, you know how to reach me. It's at the very first slide. A Procop. That's P R O K O P. I like to tell people, professional police officer. Procop, a Procop at arrowsi.com. You can send me an email uh, if you have a, a specific question, or you can reach out to us uh, through. Uh, oh my goodness, I think it's right here on this slide on the uh, the Breeze Developer Kit. Uh, there's information that you can reach out if you're interested in that. There's a phone number and there's a another email address, advisory services at arrowsi.com, to learn more information. Uh, if not, uh, Mark, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, to this uh, webinar before we uh, sign off. Andrew, just a, uh, a thank you for your time and, uh, and the uh, overview today. That was, that was great. Please, uh, please be sure to look for the recording. Pass it along to your, uh, to your fellow workers, and the other sessions are out there as well. Great. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. All right. Bye now.